നമസ്കാരം എനിക്ക് ഒത്തിരി ഒത്തിരി സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് ഐ ഹാവ് എ വെരി സ്പെഷ്യൽ ഗസ്റ്റ് ഓൺ അവർ ചാനൽ ടുഡേ പ്ലീസ് വെൽക്കം ദി ഹിസ്റ്റോറിയൻ ദ നീഡ്സ് നോ ഇൻട്രൊഡക്ഷൻ മിസ്റ്റർ മരു എസ് പി ലായ സ്വാഗതം ഹായ് ഹാപ്പി ടു ബി ഹിയർ യു നോ ഇറ്റ്സ് വണ്ടർഫുൾ ടു ഫൈനലി ബി ഓൺ യുവർ ഷോ ഐ തിങ്ക് ആഫ്റ്റർ എ കപ്പിൾ ഓഫ് ഇയേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ഫോളോയിങ് യു ഓൺ സോഷ്യൽ മീഡിയ been like really neat watching your process as you've been working and collecting information and then also you know tending to social media and it's a process it's fun i enjoy it and you know even though it's a lot of hard work if you if you enjoy doing what you're doing then you know one has no reason to complain so i guess one of the biggest things is coming up is you just released your fourth book and you know you're also working on a phd you're doing a lot of different things and as we know social media can be a complete time suck you know spending time uh doing videos and posts and research so what keeps you motivated and prevents burnout I don't know actually in terms of burnout I've come very close uh, I think very much to the verge of it which is to say that you know workaholism is not a good thing it it can get pretty unhealthy uh, but you know for most part I'm I'm pretty disciplined about my timings and about my routine etc so at 9 o'clock uh, you know come what may I stop working there's no question of going on in even if there's something exciting happening or even if i'm suddenly brighting in this burst of creativity and everything's going well i will still stop because it's important to stick to the routine and which is why of course you know if i if i end up traveling once in a while if i end up going somewhere it upsets my routine it upsets my sleep all of those things go for a toss because so much is linked to just being disciplined about how i work rather than you know the work itself uh in terms of motivation you know i think one of it is that the subject is just remarkable and fascinating and you i think the more books i write far from feeling like i'm i'm on top of it it really humbles you and you realize how much there is still to learn because you know each corner you dig into each subject you open up there are so many layers so many stories it really leaves you with a sense of firstly having just scratched the surface no matter how many how well you research how many footnotes you have and all of that you still end up feeling that there's still so much to uncover so much to learn and that for me is fascinating because i love history and just having to uh, the, the door open to discover new things means that you know it's it's always exciting it's perennially fun to keep reading and to keep sort of uh, challenging myself and i think that's how it is perhaps for a lot of uh, history enthusiasts you do something and then you know uh, the next thing just uh, again gives you a sense of awe it isn't that no moment do you feel like you've completely grasped it on the contrary uh, if if somebody tells you they've completely grasped it they're lying or they're frauds because that's simply not possible anything to do with learning and knowledge essentially comes down to this which is that it's a lifelong process and uh, you know you're constantly learning you're constantly pushing yourself and that brings the the fun and the motivation i think that's interesting that you talk about that because of all the vast types of history and different genres of history Uh, how do you settle on a scope and narrative for a certain text i mean it feels like you pick one specific thing and there can be a multitude of directions you can take it in so what's that process of kind of cutting things down to where you get comfortable saying yes this is the thing i want to focus on in research and this is how i'm going to make it into a text so you know the, there's different kinds of books i suppose have different um ways you sort of get through this question In my first book for example the ivory throne I was very clear that I wanted to tell the story of Sethu Lakshmi Bai who had been marginalized quite unfairly I thought despite having achieved a great deal in life and use her story to tell a sort of wider uh, history of court politics how power worked in a princely state and so on and so there it was largely narrative there was tremendous uh, amounts of evidence there was a lot of files and so on and all I had to do was just weave those together and in in a sense the argument sort of formed itself I was it was part biography part history with my new book false allies india's maharajas in the age of ravi varma which is about the princely states as a larger um, as a larger sort of area uh, of, of historical scholarship i am originally i'm already quite certain of what my argument is you know and then i sort of make sure that you know i have an argument that i'm trying to prove because history is also about making cases and of course there'll be other people who counter that argument and that's how the the subject itself moves forward so my argument was that you know india's princely states 40% of india's landmass was governed by these maharajas and yet we seem to give them very little attention beyond caricature and stereotypes which to me as a basic argument you know it was important to articulate that that's wrong uh, we should be able to take 40% is a huge chunk and we should be able to look at these princely states more seriously 
So having clarity that this is what I want to achieve enables you to then get a sense of what you could leave out and what you sort of make sure is in the narrative. For example, uh, you know, say you take one character or one particular period in a, in a state's history, there will be 20 different directions you are pulled in because there are so many things happening. There's cultural politics, caste politics, power politics, politics in the dynasty, economic trends, all of these things are happening simultaneously. So for example, this you know, book has five states and overall I think seven chapters. So the first part makes the overall broad argument. And then the remaining chapters are you know, focused on each princely state. So I would allocate themes on the basis of each state. So the gender issues were already covered in Travancore. So if gender arose in the Mysore chapter, I wouldn't include it. Because I've already dealt with that theme in an earlier chapter. Mysore was all about dealing with how industrialization became a form of economic nationalism to sort of you know, fight the British in a subtle way. Not that the Raja stood up and, and, and fought them in a physical sense, but through economic nationalism, he was able to break down a series of, of uh, stereotypes that the Raj had, that you know, natives were not good at these things, natives couldn't uh, do science and technology, etc. So that covers that particular theme. So then you sort of organize that in your head, you organize that on the basis of your chapters and research. And I'm a little bit, you know, I, because I get drawn into these multiple directions, I feel bad about uh, leaving things out. So that's why I have very long footnotes in my books. Uh, this book is 550 pages. 150 pages out of that is, is footnotes. Because I think it's important to leave enough juice for the reader, for the discerning reader. A lot of readers mm -hmm. will only read the main text. Uh, but for, for people who are interested in digging beneath the surface and, and getting some more sort of meat, uh, the footnotes are there for you. And all the 20 directions I've been pulled in will be covered in one way or the other in the notes section, if not in the main narrative. So I've struck my balance with it. Uh, but yeah, in, often uh, you have to sort of draw your own lines. Uh, you know, you have to decide, look, I worked this so many years on this project. It really can't, it, at the end of the day, it's also a practical proposition. It can't become an inordinate, you know, never ending process. You know, writers and historians are also human beings. And I think that's part of discipline as well. You have to draw the line and say that, look, this is my evidence, this is my argument, and I'm going to make my case in future, which is why in future, say, 20 years from now, fresh evidence may come to light. That may change some of the, the nuances of the arguments, and that's fine, because that's how historical scholarship progresses anyway. Adding to that, you seem to cover a lot of different kings, queens, and elements of monarchy. There are some people who think that historians tend to romanticize monarchy or try to over... Uh, state the importance of it. How do you feel about the presentation about general historians talking about monarchy in, in different kingdoms in the past? Well, you know, for the longest time, even into the 19th century, you know, history was all about great men. It was these great men who achieved great things, and it was almost as if it was individuals going out and, and changing history. But we know now, and we have the maturity now to realize that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, great men are often in that position, partly due to patriarchy, partly due to background. A lot of the great men uh, you know, pre-19th century often happened to just conveniently be born into a lot of aristocratic families. Very rarely did you have somebody who came up from below and did something new. And then, of course, they would then found their own dynasty and that would become a great dynasty and so on. So, there was this time when monarchy and great men and occasionally a few great women were, were the focus. But I think modern historians in today's world know that, you know, things are an overlap. Do personalities matter? Yes, they do. Because, for example, uh, you know, the current Prime Minister of India is an extremely towering figure in, in many people's minds. He's a, he's, as a person, he matters. You can't merely say that it's the processes and the trends and the economic, uh, you know, the dynamics and so on. I think that individual also matters. So, yes, the individual who's at the helm of things does matter. But I think historians also realize there are other things in place. So, example, even though my book, False Allies, is about the princely states, it doesn't romanticize the Rajas. It doesn't praise them to the high heavens and say, oh my God, what wonderful people and, and so on. It does try to look at them as political figures, which means that political figures also deal with a series of complexities. So, you know, my, Mysore Maharaja, on the face of it, he's the king of Mysore, completely in command. Not true. As I argue in the book, he, had, he never had complete control. There was pressure from the British that came on. There was pressure from his bureaucracy, which didn't always see eye to eye with him and eventually conspired to topple him. There was peasant, uh, there's peasant resistance from below. One of which was Lingayats or the Veera Shaivas, the other was the Vokaliga groupings, which are two very powerful groupings even today in democratic politics in Karnataka. Uh, so you've got peasant resistance coming up from below. There's religion that comes in. There's historical, the weight of history and legacy that sits on his shoulders. All of these things are sort of happening simultaneously in a princely state. 
So even though the king may be the face of it, the king is not necessarily even in control of most of the things that are happening in his state. And he has to fight battles not only with the British, but also internal battles. He has to maintain internal balances of power. There are historians who look specifically at the economic trends, you know, at how economic trends that are beyond the control of any human being shape uh, the course of history. And human beings don't always have the agency to, to sort of turn it or twist it in their, in their own way. On the contrary, they are led by those economic forces. Uh, you know, there's also movements that happen which is so many people, so many things flowing together that you can't really pinpoint a face and say that, oh, this is the person responsible for it. So I think now, even when you discuss the elites, even when you discuss monarchy, it can be done in a way that embraces all of these elements, the inner contradictions, the external pressures, the pressures above, the pressures below, the pressures within a dynasty. Uh, all of these things come together, and that's how you make sense even of something uh, that earlier would be a simplistic concept of the king. You know, the king is no longer uh, just the king. You realize the king is just the, the, the facade and there's a lot happening behind the facade. And there are, there are, you can be trained to sort of open your eyes to all of these things. And what's interesting is you see, see that now even in present politics ne necessarily. A president is not just the only one doing everything. Being able to flesh out these things from the past, let us see these patterns that continue now. And I think it helps people relate to the historical events more because it's like, oh, okay, we've seen that pattern. We like to try to have a unbiased account of history. It should be just tell what exactly happened and let people kind of make sense of it. And other people argue that there should be more critical lens when examining history. But when we consider the sources that we're looking at, when we consider who wrote the things that we're examining as we research, is it truly possible to present history in an unbiased way? It isn't, because I think even historians are human beings. As I said earlier, uh, we are all creatures of our time and context, which means that even without realizing it, we may have certain filters in front of our eyes, which color the way we perceive certain things. My, the, the, the standard example I give is that if you went back a hundred years ago to the great stalwarts of the time, Jadun, in Indian history, Jadunath Sarkar, Sardesai, that generation, and you try to explain to them the feminist perspective, they would not have understood it. It would not have even struck them as something... Uh, you know, uh, to bring on board as they investigate history. But today it's very difficult not to look at history through the feminist perspective because that's completely altered the way we approach even the fundamental evidence, even the files and records that we have. And that feminist perspective has allowed us to read between the lines, allowed us to unearth historical women who've otherwise just been sort of put away in the harem, you know, put away under various stereotypes and you're able to flesh them out better because you have that perspective. In future, there may be an LGBT perspective that comes, which may completely amend the way we look at a lot of subjects, uh, whether it's political history, whether it is uh, personal histories and the history of gender, sexuality, all of those things. These are things that are just opening up now. So it's very likely that 20 years into the future, um, kids studying history then will have a very different uh, approach to a lot, of these, a lot of these questions. But no, I don't think history can ever be unbiased. That's why I say history is always an argument and there's going to be a counter argument. The question is, whose method is more convincing. Now, you can't just counter my argument by saying, oh, I don't believe it. That's not really a historical argument. You don't believe in it is, is, is your opinion. It's not an, a historical argument. Uh, similarly, you know, people have to flesh out why they're countering it. It has to be done with certain ground rules. It has to be done with in, a, in, in a certain process. And that's where historians are trained. You know, it's the process that makes all the difference, not necessarily, um, you know, this other format that people sometimes prefer. Then there's the question of, how diverse are your sources? You know, you can make a stronger mm -hmm. argument in history based on the diversity of sources. In India, which was a caste-based society, written records have only privileged the voices and the, the viewpoints of a very small sliver of society that was literate, had access to writing, and man managed to keep records, which is usually uh, the priestly class, the teachers, the, 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 the princely rulers. They are the ones who kept records. You go down into society, seem to marginalize castes, etc., you will find that a lot of their memories of the past are recorded in lore and song and legends, not necessarily in well-written sort of historical documents. Now, obviously, their accounts may not be chronologically sound. There may be some errors in it. There may be all kinds of issues with it. But there are historians are trained to sort of manage that because it doesn't mean that the oral narrative has no value. On the contrary, it has tremendous value. You can marry oral narrative to your written records, then you look at artworks that exist from a certain time, you look at the bronzes that exist from a certain time, you look at the buildings that exist from a certain time. All of these put together gives you a more comprehensive idea of what 
that period may have been like and then you make your argument then you make your statement of, of historical scholarship but unless we dig into all these sources uh, we even dig into fiction in the sense that you know again a, a standard example I give is that partition we can look at it the partition of India in 1947 through the statistics you know so many people displaced so many millions attacked women violated and raped all of those statistics exist but if you look at contemporary fiction as Manto wrote, for example, his short stories about partition, that really brings out the emotional turmoil. So future historians, say 300 years into the future, studying partition will make use of these fiction sources as well because that fiction from that time reflects the angst that people were feeling, which you may not get from the facts and the, and the records and the written material. Uh, I was recently, in fact, trolled by a, by a politician because in, a, in an interview on the Mapla Muslims of Kerala, I recounted this whole legend called the Parai Petta Pandirukulam in Kerala, which is about the sage Vararuchi and his Parayar caste wife and they have a series of children. One son is a Brahmin, another is, uh, is Perindachan, a famous architect. There's a daughter from whom there's a Naya family that claims descent. And among these children, there's also a Muslim uh, called Uputan Mapla, Mapla. And the funny thing is, this gentleman went on a rampage on this rather odd little social media Facebook post where he said, as per my calculations, Vararuchi lived, I think he says, 4th or 5th century. Islam was only created in the 7th century. So this historian is lying and his credibility is completely lost when he says one of his, uh, one of Vararuchi's children was a Muslim. Now, firstly, two things here. One, I did not invent the legend. So if you have a chronological problem, please travel back 6 or 7 centuries and pick a fight with whoever uh, invented the legend. As a historian, I understand that le legends are not about chronological history. They're not about well-referenced, footnoted history. In fact, to even treat legends that way is to wear a colonialist lens because when the British ruled India, they came and they looked at all our Puranic sources, all our traditions and they said, oh, you people don't have history. You people are not good at writing history. All you have is stories. But the thing is, in a tropical country where records could not be maintained easily with so much diversity, it was through stories that these things were passed down. Even the Vedas were originally orally recited and transmitted generation to generation. They were written down only uh, relatively recently, somewhere in the last thousand years. So orality is an important thing to pass on cultural memory. And that orality means that people have to be able to remember. And people remember well when there are stories. That's why the Puranas are full of stories. Some of them are contradictory. Characters in one story appear, you know, apparently centuries later in a completely different yuga or a completely different timeline, um, you know, when, when people say that Parshurama threw the battle axe and that's how Kerala was born, in reality it's very unlikely a man threw a battle axe and did that. But it, it, it carries the hint that there was some kind of an event involving the sea by which this, this land was sort of moved up and then, then occupied by people and so on. Historians are able to see legends and pick out the grains of truth that the legend is trying to communicate. Historians are not sitting there saying, oh, this legend is written there. It, it's either false or it's true. No, nothing in life is as black and white as that. It's complex. So when this Parai Betta Pandurukulam story, even if the character in it was pre-Islamic and supposedly had a Muslim son, uh, even if that is the case, the legend isn't trying to make some chronological argument. The legend is trying to create a space for the Muslim in Kerala's worldview, in the Kerala narrative, in Kerala's cultural memory. So if you say that the man has a Brahmin son, a son from the carpenter caste, a Naya daughter, etc., adding a Muslim son to the story is a way of including another segment of society into that story. That is what the legend is trying to do. Uh, there's the, the, one of the key sources in, in Kerala's legendary history is this text called the Kerala Pati. And you know, if you look at the Kerala Pati, you will find a lot of uh, chronological anomalies. There's the Vijayanagara Emperor Krishnadeva Raya of the 1500s, who's placed centuries before he was even born in the Kerlolpati. Now, if this politician were to have his way, I would say, all false, throw this Kerlolpati out, it's all rubbish. But no, as a historian, my job is not to call something rubbish. The fact is that text is still trying to communicate something. And the question I need to ask is, why is it so important for the text to include Krishnadeva Raya in the story? Clearly, he matters and he's supposed to signify something, either a political milestone, some kind of cultural memory. That is why his name and story has been incorporated into this text, even though chronologically it does not make sense. But this is the, this is the perils and pitfalls of social media. You know, you can't necessarily have a nuanced argument. You certainly can't have it with politicians. Uh, the only good thing that came out of that controversy is that while well, I, I started getting tagged in messages saying your credibility is destroyed, you've been completely sort of smashed as a historian and so on. In my mind, I was actually very happy because frankly, when politicians start attacking you, it's a sign that your credibility has probably gone up 
not dull. You're, 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 if you're making people upset, that means that they're actually paying attention to you. So <laughs> that's always an interesting experience. I'm a big proponent of social media for education. Clearly, that's what my whole platform is about. But combating against the speed at which things travel, like of you know ridiculous WhatsApp forwards and and misinformation and you know malicious misinformation, it's it's really hard to keep some of these things in check. And it's like you you correct one fact and then a hundred more you know messages are coming through. And it, like, how do you not feel overwhelmed sometimes or kind of like I don't know pessimistic about? people and the way that they're learning about history or incorrectly learning about things, do you, do you feel that it's demotivating or, or do you feel like there's still, uh, it's still worth it to reach out and, and continue providing education and explaining things despite maybe having explained it several times already? I think it's worth it because, I mean, of course, as individuals who are working in this space, and you probably know this as well, the first thing we need to have is a thick skin. Because one of the, the, the pitfalls of social media is that you're putting yourself out there, which means that people view you not necessarily as a human being. They're often hidden behind just profile pictures or names, many of them fake. And there's a certain cruelty it allows people to manifest. And I think, firstly, we need to accept that that is just people being people. And it's not necessarily uh, about us. It, it tells you more about them. And, and, and social media as a platform, as a, as a process that's changing the world itself rather than about us as individuals. So, you know, I, I have a pretty thick skin, so I really don't get too distracted with these things. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the one thing is, you know, as I said, if people are attacking you repeatedly on, and, and, and the arguments aren't even sensible, they're completely unintelligent claims, then there's no reason to feel um, uh, insecure about it. But it does get irritating sometimes. There can be moments where you feel that, you know, uh, why are people really this idiotic, like one random person says something and you just fall for it. Uh, there was this WhatsApp video that was going around which said Tipu Sultan has been uh, shown to us through these oil paintings as this, you know, regal looking figure because the painting show him as regal. But this is his reality and it shows a photograph of a gentleman from Africa. And what's interesting is your basic common sense, if you even like read anything in life, would tell you that uh, Tipu Sultan died decades before the, the camera was invented and photography became a thing. Mm -hmm. So it's simply I'm impossible for a photograph to exist of Tipu Sultan. Uh, but no, people apparently buy into this thing uh, pretty easily. But the question is, we have to also pick and choose our battles. I am not in the battle to, to sort of fight people uh, on social media about, about fake news and all of that. There are other people doing it and doing it pretty well. I'm going to stick to what I'm good at, which is writing longer form books and essays and that kind of thing, which gives me the space to articulate something with the footnotes, with the details, with all the complexities and, you know, sort of make my case. It, it may not have the wild popularity that a lot of social media, uh, you know, output does. And so I try to balance it. I do have a, an Instagram account, which is quite active, even though I'm not very active on anything else. Uh, so I try to do a mix and match, but broadly, I'm very clear on what I'm working on. I have a thick skin, so I really don't get affected too much by people. I don't hesitate at all to block people, block, 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 because why, you know, uh, ruin your space? Uh, let them let them say whatever they want to want into the void, uh, not on my my timeline. So I'm going to block you left, right, and center if you if you uh, come and start attacking me on my timeline. Attack me on yours if you want. Don't come into my business and my space. Uh, so, you know, make a few adjustments like that. And as I said, on, on a philosophical level, this is not about me or about, you know, you, or you and I. This is really about social media as a process the world is going through, as a phenomenon in a world where there were certain norms of decency, where even if you disagreed with somebody, there was a way you did it. And social media sort of tears apart all those norms and it allows people to sort of just attack other people. Uh, almost as if they aren't human beings, almost as if human beings aren't allowed to make mistakes. And, and you know, you, the, the problem with social media also is that all human beings make mistake. mistakes. You know, the, the, the greatest of scholars, the best, the finest of, of minds in the world, they are also ultimately human. So we just need to learn to be a little more sympathetic to each other. Uh, until that day comes, Block, block. I always tell myself, let your work speak for itself. You know, you've, you've done the work, you've done the research, you've talked with really interesting people and, you know, you've had this good network. And I think having a positive network is also really important. People who are in the same field as you or have the same mindset as you, I think that's what 
keeps people going, you know, especially when they deal with these attacks or ridiculous comments or, you know, these types of things. But as you said, once you're someone in the public eye, you're now a public figure. And I've seen some of my friends who are content creators get their images used against, you know, their will, manipulated, but people say, well, you're a public figure, so that just comes with the territory, you know? (laughs) So it's like, oh, I didn't consent to that, but anyway. So of course, as you know, my page is focused on Malayalam and Kerala and Kerala culture. And I think that there are so many interesting Malayalis from history that have taken a part in the greater history of the Indian continent, but their contributions are not necessarily always highlighted in textbooks or course books. So did you have any characters in mind that you wanted to talk about today to kind of show more people of how Malayalis have contributed to history? Well, you know, uh, since the fourth book, the, the, the one that's just out, False Allies, is about the princely states, the one that immediately springs to mind is VP Menon because he was the, the right-hand man of Sardar Patel in the, in the states ministry after independence, which actually integrated all these princely states into the Indian Union. And it wasn't an easy job because he had to go meet many of these rajas individually, deal with their internal politics, their egos, sort of, you know, calm them down, sometimes, you know, hold the, the, the carrot, sometimes hold the stick and sort of just get the work done. And it happened, if you now think of it, happened so fast, almost in record time. Uh, you know, in many ways, VP Menon is is as responsible as uh, Sardar Patel in helping us uh, create this current map of India as we see it today because, you know, integrating all these states was not a, a, a small job. So that's one, you know, example. Uh, Setu Lakshmi Bai, my, my protagonist from my first, first book, you know, she was a woman ruler and on the face of it you would say, oh, royalty, so she must be very privileged. But you realize that, you know, I, gender can marginalize you no matter how rich you are. No matter how successful you are, if you're a woman in a man's world and in a colonial uh, man's world, that's going to put you at a disadvantage. In her case, uh, she was, you know, not only marginalized in the sense that because she was from a princely state post-independence with the focus moving to nationalism and the freedom struggle, that anyway eclipsed uh, what was happening in the princely states. But as a woman uh, who did not get along with the Maharaja in the same family, uh, he managed to sort of corner much of the limelight uh, where, where she was written out of history, which was ironic because even in 1949, uh, some 18 years after she had stopped ruling, the Indian government had, um, uh, in, in its state ministry records, it says that she continues to be more popular even than the Maharaja. She hadn't been ruling for nearly two decades. But today, if you go to Trivandrum, people won't really know much about her. It's about the Maharaja that they speak, simply because there's a PR machine, there's all of that that worked around him, whereas she was just eclipsed out of history. And even in terms of her achievements, it wasn't that she was a woman ruler and therefore, you know, as a token figure, she was there. I remember a conversation with Jay Devika, the scholar, who was telling me how she opened up spaces for women. She didn't necessarily promote individual women and make it about the individuals, but she opened up spaces for women. So seats in the legislative assembly, seats in the representative assembly, allowing them to go and study law, scholarships for studying medicine. You know, and, and, and these scholarships were allocated to girls from the fishing community, the Naya community, the Christian community, across castes and, and, and backgrounds. Uh, you know, supporting the first feature film that was made in the 1920s in Travancore. You know, these things add up. And you realize that this one little shy reserved woman in a munda sitting in, in, in Trivandrum, uh, you know, did in her seven years manage to, to set off several very good things. Not that she was a perfect sort of person, no human being is. But even so, I think it's important to highlight the stories of women. And I try to do that in a, in a number of books of mine. But I think that history, in my own opinion, is not just about these big heroes that like saved this or you know did these operations, but the small people who, who worked in, in grassroots areas and, and helped start like movements and things like that. And no, and also, you know, there are these small rebellions that happen in households. I've given this example a couple of times. I was reading uh, Devaki Nilayangod's memoir. She was a Brahmin woman from a Nambudri family, grew up in a very orthodox household. Uh, every time women had their periods, they had to go and sit in a separate room and isolate themselves for that many days. And what was interesting in her memoirs was she talks about how the elder men in the family, the brothers and the fathers, would not allow the women to read. It was not seen as proper for women, especially magazines and newspapers, which sort of report everything that's happening around the world. So good women do not read these things. And apparently it was in that room when they were isolating that they would read this contraband literature because for once they had space to themselves. So the room where women have to segregate themselves during their periods is in many ways a symbol of patriarchy, right? And right in that room, under the nose of those same men, these women were managing to subvert 
uh, the, the, that, that entire ecosystem, that entire principle. You know, these are nameless figures. The, the rise of the Edava community in the 19th century, you know, they were, early 19th century, they were far behind, you know, almost at the level of what we now call the Dalit caste, as marginalized as that. But they, they had large numbers and through the 19th century, partly because of changes in the economy, because of colonialism, access to markets, increased access to cash, they were able to start buying land. And land naturally brings you prestige. Prestige also brings an, you know, a sort of confidence about yourself. Inner reformers like Sri Narayana Guru and, and, and the poets Kumar Nashan and so on gave the community a sense of self-worth and confidence and said, you know, you are a force to reckon with. These, gen the men I, I refer to are, are in some ways the face of the movement. But the movement itself was backed by, uh, by a lot of women as well. Uh, you know, and these are working women. It wasn't like these women had the comfort and luxury of sitting at home. Uh, somewhere like the Vaikam Satyagraha, you know, when, which was happening in Vaikam in 1924, it was women who went around with this thing called the PDRE scheme, where they would go house to house and gather just one fistful of rice to feed the people agitating in Vaikam. It's, you know, it's, it's so fascinating that there are these women, they're present throughout politics, they're present in these movements, they were present in the fields of Kerala, but we don't know their names, you know, many of them are not historical figures in the way we, we think of, but that's, this is why I said, if you listen to the songs and legends of the, of the old uh, communities that actually till the fields, you will come up with, uh, with interesting stories, it does have a female voice, it does have a female presence, it does tell you a lot more, even something like the Padmanabha Swami temple in Trivandrum. It's fascinating that most people now talk of the legend where there's a sage and he's, he's sitting somewhere in North Kerala and doing his, his, his uh, penance and this child comes and sort of interrupts him. And eventually it turns out this child is, is of course Mahavishnu himself, the, the god. And the, the child tells him, if you want to see me again, you must come to Anandankada. And this gentleman then pursues the child, gets to Anandankada and that's how the temple is created. The god gives him a full darshan there. But there's also what you would call a subaltern legend, which is not spoken about much today, which is about a Pulea caste woman. She's tilling in the fields and she comes across a little baby boy who seems very, uh, you know, interesting and different. And she washes him, breastfeeds him and makes him sit under the under a tree. And, uh, and when she comes back after work, she sees that he's being shielded from the sun or generally protected by a cobra. And she realizes, wow, there's something divine about this child. She starts worshipping the child. She starts worshipping at that spot. And that spot later evolves into a grove, it becomes a temple and then becomes the Padmanabha Swami temple of today. Wow. Wow. This legend isn't spoken about that much, but at the core of it is this Pulaya woman. Uh, not a sage, not somebody doing uh, meditation and penance. This is a working woman in the field who has an experience with the divine. Even in the stories we, we choose to tell, there can, there can sometimes be a politics, there can be sometimes a selective way of, of, of remembering these things. And this is where a lot of historical, uh, you know, Figures who, as I said, are nameless, uh, don't necessarily stand out as individuals, but they are very much part of the story. And it, I think historians owe it to uh, everybody to be able to unearth many of these stories. Neat. Well, thanks for that. As we move on, I decided I wanted to test your knowledge of a very specific kind of history. So if you are willing, <laughs> I have a little game to play with you. It's a quick oh dear, Sounds ominous. Ominous? No, no. Look, do I look like an ominous character? <laughs> I'm so, so harmless. So, I know one thing about you, and that is you love cake. Like, oh, like I do. you have an obsession with cake. Like, I do. That's, <laughs> if anybody reads Manu's stories, he's either dreaming about cake, indulging in cake, or dreaming about indulging in cake. Um, so, I'm hoping that I can surprise you with a little bit of history here. So, I'm sharing my screen. And we're going to talk about the history of cake in India. Wow. <laughs> um, all right. so, this be fun. <laughs> so let's start with what year was the first cake baked in India, like in the whole Indian continent by an Indian baker? What year was it baked? I don't want to say 1883 because that sounds very late. 1823 is probably a safe bet, but I wouldn't be too surprised if it, if it was 1783 as well. I think I'll go with 1783. Okay. Nope. <laughs> oh. Okay, since you're obviously, you know, you have a sort of Kerala bias, I'll say Talasheri, uh, because there was British presence there. Kuchin was under the Raja, so I'm not entirely sure it could have happened there. Maybe Talasheri? Ding, 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 ding. Yes. So, in all of the Indian continent, the first cake was baked in Talasheri. So, the, 
Yeah, and so this bakery was owned by Mambali Bapu. And uh, one of these is the name of his bakery, which still exists today in Dalasheri. Let's go with Regal. It's oh, the man. Royal Biscuit Factory. Actually, you're right. It does make sense. A lot of things in those days would have a royal attached to their, to their names. Right, okay. right. Okay, but my, my distractors did their job. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> so there was only one other bakery in India uh, at that time. So this one was the, the first one, but there was another one that opened around the same time in all of the continent. Where was it? I would say Bengal presidency, maybe, you know. There were also anglicized Bengalis, so maybe... Ah, yes. Did Lucky. Good job. Good job. Okay, got no, two, no. two right, two wrong. Okay. <laughs> so, Bapu, uh, Mr. Bapu was actually working outside of Talasheri before coming back home, and he was shipping things like milk, sugar, and other supplies to British soldiers that were occupying what is now Egypt, right? And so, um, where was he working from? I go with option one. The two, co two coast states in UAE. UAE, right? yeah. Nope, oh, that was in Burma. Yeah. yeah. So this 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 Burma trader came back to Talasheri and was approached by a Mr. Murdoch Brown, and he came to Mr. Babu and said, "I want you to make this." Mm. So what did he want him to make? I wouldn't say a rum cake, or was it? I mean, it could be, let's go with a fruit cake. Seems simpler than some of the other options. Malayali or no? Ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> Kerala Wrong. is like so famous for its plum cakes. So yeah, he basically brought a plum cake from England and from Britain and said, can you recreate this cake? And, you know, he basically gave him a slice to taste, have the texture, the shape and said, I want you to do this. And he suggested to get brandy from Mahe, which was a French colony, as you know. And But Mr. Bapu, he didn't want to go. He instead used a local uh, beverage. And this is a special local liqueur made from fermented what? Let's see. I mean, I'm, I'm playing entirely with the, the Padam word here, which means there must be some banana element there. Uh, Maybe cashew and banana. All right. And that is the correct answer. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So, oh, was that no, one? that's so not fair. It was four out of six. I got. I think I got three out of six. Okay. So we'll, so we'll stop the count. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> and cashew and banana makes sense because, you know, Goa, nearby Goa, has the fenny beverage, which is like cashew. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah, so instead of the brandy, he made that. And so since then, you know, uh, so many uh, communities in all of Kerala partake in these, these plum cakes. And it started there in Talasheri, and I had the opportunity to visit it back in 2019. Um, still, Must still go check there. it out next yeah. time. Yeah, I will Yeah, you, you really should. You really should. And, and definitely um, indulge in some cakes. So <laughs> I'm really glad that I got to teach <laughs> this industry today. <laughs> Like Indian citizens did such an interesting twist on the way they do things, you know, how they said, okay, well, there's this, this, and this that comes from here, but we're going to do it our way. And I think that this this plum cake is, is a really shining example of that. As we wrap things up, uh, let's talk about where people can find your books and know more about you and follow the work that you do. Well, my books are should, well, they should be in all stores by now. If you're in Kerala, uh, DC Books, for example, is definitely stalking it. Modern Book Center in Trivandrum, uh, the Matrubhumi Bookstore in Kochi. So I think all the all the usual suspects in Kerala will definitely have the book. In fact, I've just signed 20 copies for the Trivandrum Modern Book Center, so it will soon be available there. Um, obviously, Amazon online, but not around the world, only Amazon India. The book is only available for sale in the Indian subcontinent. And you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter. I, I, I chiefly only retweet things. I don't, I'm not very active on Twitter because everybody's fighting half the time and I don't like spaces like that. Uh, Instagram for me is a happier place and I'm more active on Instagram. So you can find me there on Wat Coconut, at Wat Coconut. And Instagram is uh, Unam Pile. Unam is, is a, a, a sort of inversion of my name because there is somebody else who has at Manu Pile and 
I don't know who it is. That person hasn't used that account since 2012 or something, uh, which is unfortunate. Manu S. <laughs> there is a Manu S. Pillay as well, so I can't. And I have a website, which is manuspillay.com. And for everything else, yeah, I think that should be enough. And then also my platform is all about promoting other people within spheres. So if you can just let us know some other historians that you think are really great, especially in the context of Indian history and Kerala history in general, um, what are some people that you would recommend to follow or read up on? I love Ira Mukoti's work. You know, she's, uh, she actually came from a science background, but she's been writing on history uh, for a while now. She did one a very charming book called Daughters of the Sun, which is about the women in the Mughal court. Again, with the Mughals, the focus is usually on the emperors and the men and the battles. But this is about women and how the idea of the harem was not just women sort of lounging about or pursuing only domestic things. There were traders, merchants, diplomats. Many of them went out riding. Many of them had sort of collective bargaining power at court, so much so that even a powerful emperor like Akbar was sometimes, uh, he could be pushed into doing things he didn't want to do by the harem. Just again showing how complex uh, politics was in the day. Back in the day, it wasn't just the king taking decisions as he pleased. Uh, that's a wonderful writer. There's Parvati Sharma who did this very charming biography of Jahangir, uh, which I which I loved thoroughly. Supriya Gandhi did a, a, a wonderful book on Dara Shuko, the Mughal prince. Um, there's a, so yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of scholars and writers who are increasingly now writing for a general audience, no longer just for academics and people who use jargon. It's for for readers across the board. And here are three names. I hope you you know your 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 viewers pick up at least one of these books and read them. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was really fun talking to you today. I watch well. Anyway, good luck with your future work on your PhD and whatever else you have coming down the pipeline. I know you've got notes already for your next installation. So, <laughs> best of luck with that. Thanks. Thanks. And thank you again for having me.